Hello, I'm Paul Briley, and you're listening to Off The Comma. I'm a human who cares about supporting other humans. On this podcast, we'll explore all facets of what it means to feel stuck in life. We talk with people just like us who have found themselves sitting on a comma and not knowing where to go next. We'll unpack the experience with them, where they've been stuck, what it feels like, what they experienced, and what they learned. My goal is to inspire you by seeing yourself in others. I believe that when we feel more connected and seen, magic can happen. And we are back for another episode. And I am really excited because like in some of my past episodes, um, I am have the fortune of being able to talk to someone who's a new friend and a new acquaintance to me. And so we, we've been getting to know each other a little bit through a shared colleague who I believe he's going to be talking about later in the episode. And just so exciting as we kind of start to get to know each other to see, you know, how some of the lanes in our roads run parallel at times. And so I'm really excited to hear his story. So, uh, and Wazoo, I'm very happy to have you here with us this week. Like with other episodes, you know, you and I haven't talked about what you're going to be sharing today. So I'm really excited and honored to be able to, to be front row and center for, for what you're going to be sharing with us today. So I'm going to stop there and hand it over to you because today it's your episode and it's your platform. So, and Wazoo, how would you like to be known and what would you like people to know about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Um, thank you for this great opportunity to share um, this experience with you. Of the comma, I know I had it for the first time last year and it was I was so thrilled to see where this goes. And having to meet you again this year, having that conversation, I was invited for this great podcast. And I must tell you, I'm I'm running to catch up with almost all the 20 episodes that I've already gone live, you know, so it's so exciting. Mm. So how would I like to introduce myself? I would say I'm very optimistic. I'm selfless. I like to bring out the best in people. So I, I see the good in people and I consistently empower people to, to be the best version of themselves. That is for me... Um, like a life goal, because because it's one of the things that I have found that the more I share with people and try to work with them, I feel the energy in me coming out and trying to, um, I'm always super excited to do that. You know, I, I can give and give and give and give and give and, and not feel like I'm giving. I don't know if you, if you know that feeling. Yeah, right? well, I mean, that's powerful, right? Because you talk about this feeling of giving and yet it, it, you receive through this act of giving. So that, that sounds really powerful. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so I, I my background, it's it's a, a very diverse background in terms of culture, in terms of value systems, because I've lived in different places, right? And my upbringing is from a very humble background as well. A lot of spirituality and my parents tried to get us to go to church and I kind of worked myself through that, you know, so I have a very strong spirituality based uh, religion and all that. So, and I think growing up, I have seen different shades in terms of living in a lot and also having to deal with lack. I'm, I'm trying to go back to my early childhood. It's interesting what this podcast does to you, mm -hmm. you know, so, because this is not scripted, so it's kind of taking me aback as I'm talking. I'm trying to relieve some of my past experiences as well while I'm trying to be present here. So I, I've seen situations mm -hmm. where um, we wake up in the morning, there's nothing to eat. And I've also seen situations where we wake up in the morning, there's a lot to eat. And in the neighborhood of growing, in my neighborhood growing up as well, I've happened to be a source of inspiration to people, try to tell them that there is hope. You know, so I kind of carry that along in my my education as well, right? Having gone through um, primary, secondary education like we have it back in Nigeria, and also having to live in the UK and living in America now, so I have that great journey, in my own opinion, of having lived in different situations, and have hope for the times that things are not great, that it will always get better. Mm. You know, so and I've seen it work. You know, so I, I've I've lived in a situation where I I didn't know what was going to happen the next day, and I was optimistic, and I, I put in the effort, and things changed. You know, so for me, um, sharing that with people, empowering people, letting them know that whatever situation you're going through, um, I mean, it's it's not like I know the future, but I, I'm very optimistic that 
it might get better. You know, things can get better. So whatever direction you're going in life, and I always like to share my experiences with people. Maybe they can pick up inspiration from that, you know, depending on the situation. That's I really appreciate that. I want to take a moment and reflect that back because, you know, that's kind of what we do here, too, is, you know, your own experiences. You talk about your own experiences, you know, with lack and with uh, abundance and 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 this this kind of element I, I'm really kind of processing myself this element of having experienced so many things and seeing so many things when often many of us only see our lane it's funny this lanes analogy seems to come up again you've been in a lot of rain, lanes on a lot of different roads and so that's allowed you to see possibility and see kind of this bigger perspective, whereas a lot of times many of us just stay in one lane and that's the only lane we can see. And we can't, we can't comprehend other lanes, other traffic, other, other routes. Right. So that's, that's really cool that you have chosen to take this kind of life experience of yours and then be able to help that sort of be a light for other people, help them see more than what they're currently seeing. Is that, is that a fair reflection of what I'm hearing you say? You, you, that's very articulate. I, I, I'm i amazed how you put this together. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is a thing that the universe wants me to do. You, you want to, you want to give and receive through others and, and inspire others. And, and you, you have your, your tools and your gifts that we're going to learn more about today. And I think that's kind of the, that's, that's the tools that the universe has given me. So, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's we'll do that during this episode and and as we normally do and so my invitation to you and wazoo is you know anytime you hear me reflect something back and it's like no that didn't quite hit the spot or that didn't hit the mark or whatever by all means correct me and um yeah let's let's have the conversation let's see what comes up so let's let's jump in and uh before we get to the five questions i ask every guest the same five questions and that's where the story unfolds i always like to start with the first one which is as you think about this conversation we're about to have and the story that you're about to tell what would be your intention for yourself uh, that's a great question I, I think i struggle with these because of the importance of all my experiences and I think I'm sure enough today being present, not knowing what's going to happen, mm. right? And then and, and leaning in into what's this, where this conversation goes so that I can discover more about myself, mm. you know? So, and I don't want to come with a presumption of this is, I think uh, maybe this is how it's going to go. I want to be open to wherever it leads me so that I can learn more about myself. Having been privileged to um, gone through a lot of training, gone through a lot of education, gone through a lot of life experiences, and I don't want to tie it to anything. And I, I understand a lot about psychology. And I understand a lot about coaching. I don't I understand a lot about some of the things that I do. But I want to be here today, enjoy this moment with you and share these experiences and see where it leads me so that I can discover more for myself because I'm a lifelong learner. Mm. Nice, nice. I I see your intention and I want to add to that. My intention is to be able to create a container for you to be able to do exactly what you just said and 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 achieve the intention. And my intention is that in hearing your story, there are folks out there who will connect with it. There will be parts of it that resonate with them and that it will inspire them and hopefully empower them. And perhaps someone out there will hear something that you say today that helps them treat themselves a little bit lighter and then subsequently treat someone else in their circle or their world a little bit lighter as well. So that's my intention. That's powerful. Nice. <laughs> that's let's, powerful. Let, let's jump in, Imwasu. So the first question is, where have you found yourself sitting on a comma in your life? Hmm. You know, um, after I got the invitation to be at this um, podcast, I've asked myself a lot of questions, right? And then again, leaning into my background, because I'm very optimistic and I like to set goals and accomplish them. I said goals that to me might sound impossible. You know, this is this is me living in Nigeria, having no money, and thinking to myself, I like to go abroad to study, right? Without knowing where the finances is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And 
I was going to go to the UK to study. I've never lived on, outside Nigeria. I've been to a few African countries, but not like live there, you know. And I set out this this massive goal for myself, and I saw things unfold within months. Right, that same year that I decided to go abroad to study was the same year I went to the UK. Mm. Right. So mm-hmm. and and for me, um, that experience kind of opened the. Uh, for lack of a better word, I don't even know what that means, like the Pandora box for possibilities, right? Mm. You know, that there is a lot that you can achieve when you set goals and you push yourself to to to, to the highest limit, right? So imagine me leaving Nigeria, showing up in Scotland for the first time, not knowing what the culture is, right? And, wow. and going to university in a foreign country, the temperature, the culture, the people, you know, just throwing myself into that deep um, side of the ocean without learning, without knowing how to swim or knowing anything about life jacket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so daring myself to to such um um um, would I say audacious stacks, right? And pulling through that process, it wasn't easy. You know, it was very very challenging culturally, economically. You know, and that was the height of the whole um, global recession. Mm-hmm. You know, when well, where all the plans that I've made, how I'm going to survive in the UK, getting on ground was totally opposite. Mm-hmm. Right. There were no jobs. People, people, businesses were folding up, you know, so opportunities that I thought I had when I leave Nigeria was not longer there. And I have to improvise and find a means to survive in Scotland. So, so I, I want to acknowledge you for that, because, boy, I mean, you 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 packed so much in there that. You had this goal, you created a vision for yourself and, and then you kind of threw yourself into it and you didn't just throw yourself into it. You threw yourself far into it and you threw yourself far and into a space that you had, it sounds like, and I'll ask another question. Um, it sounds like you didn't really have a vision of exactly what it was going to look like. And that like, you didn't just take the leap. You went all the way and found yourself in a complete completely foreign and unfamiliar and and strange kind of circumstance like you just went there yes yes i, I had a vision right i had a plan <laughs> mm-hmm. but I, I, okay. I don't know if it was mike tyson or muhammad ali that said it you have a plan until you get punched in the face yeah right? yeah <laughs> you know yeah so i had a vision and i had a plan of what to do right so and but when i got there without knowing fully uh, comprehending what the world economy is like you know when i got there and the recession hit it was a different ball game you know have to improvise and find a way to survive right so and thinking deep into those experiences i mean the question is where do i find myself sitting on a comma Mm -hmm. right i've set goals and i've achieved them not knowing how to achieve them but it has come Mm -hmm. to pass you know so i consistently set goals so I didn't know if I was sitting on a comma or it was one of those things that I want to do, but I've not, I've not yet processed it or I'm doing it, but I'm trying to figure out how to get the goal achieved. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think it was some, some time two years ago. And, and, I, and I apologize if I, if I, if I'm taking you on this whole different parts of my journey. Not, actually, and Wazoo, <laughs> not at all, because this is organic. And and a lot of times guests will show up and they already have a story from the past and it's all buttoned up and they already kind of have the narrative. Sometimes people show up and say, I'm sitting on a comma right now. I kind of don't know where it's going. So no, 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 it's, it's your story. You get to kind of like tell it however you'd like. I, I'd love to ask a question though, if I may, about what you've described so far, because it sounds like you've kind of told us about a time in the past where you were sitting on a comma because you had a goal, you had a plan, you threw yourself into it. And then now you had to kind of figure out the actual day-to-day mechanics of, of making that come to pass. Right. And then everything that that situation created for you. But before we continue on with what you were about to share, there's something I think it would be really valuable for people who are listening to hear because we hear this message a lot, like have a plan, create a vision, throw yourself into it, take the leap. Like that's not new messaging for a lot of folks. But I think there's a lot of folks out there who wonder, what does that actually look like? Like I can have a plan, but like what what does the actual physical 
moving from the plan into that leap look like? So I'd love to ask you that question. That sounded like such a big experience. What was it like in the day to day? Like, how did you get from that goal and that intention and that vision into buying the ticket, making the trip, finding yourself standing on the streets of Scotland? Like, what was that like for you? Great question. Great question. And and, and this year, you're trying to um, articulate a question and ask me the question. My mind was racing like really, really fast. <laughs> yeah. You know, in back to, to the, those experiences and what those moments was like for me, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's something is like a cliche, like set a goal, you know, plan it, execute it in a system that works or in a system that is, is very uh, predictable. Mm. Right. But when you don't know enough and you take that leap of faith, it's a different ball game, in my opinion. Right. Right. You know, I've never bought an international ticket by myself to go to anywhere. Right. And and, and I've, n- I've not saved up money, paid school fees to be an international student before that whole experience happened. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was just. And again, we say like an African proverb, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time, right? Hoping that those bites will be the right bites and the things that you can you can um, digest and, and it will be valuable to you, you know? So it was huge. To your point, buying the ticket was an experience. Getting on the plane was an experience. Touching down. <laughs> now I get to laugh. Yeah, because yeah. there are some of these things that you see in movies and if it happens to you in real life, you don't get to connect it until later in life, mm. right? So why do I say this? There's a particular moment in a movie called Cool Running. Um, I think it's the Jamaican bobsleigh team was going to participate for the first time in the Winter Olympics or something like that. I can't remember the whole story. But they got to the airport, I think it was somewhere in Norway or Switzerland where they were supposed to um, do the activity. And because they were coming from a very tropical place to a temperate place, they they were they came out of the airport and they were forced back into the airport lobby to change and wear all their jackets and winter coats mm-hmm. because it was freezing, right? Mm-hmm. Now, this is me showing up from Lagos, Nigeria, Lagos boy, you know, and I got to Heathrow, London. And my friend that has come to pick me up, got my luggage, we we're so excited. Let's go, let's get in the, in, the, in the black taxi, in the black cab. That was before the Uber days, right? And the moment the glass door opened, and I stepped out and I felt the temperature. Time froze for me. Mm. I stood there, moved a little bit back, and the glass closed again. My friend walked. I could see him because it was a glass door. I could see him walk towards the taxi. He was talking and looked back. He thought I was following him, but I was still standing there because I couldn't deal with the cold. Right? I had to open my bag mm-hmm. again, brother, more clothes. And I wore them. What was happening for you in that moment when time froze? This is so powerful. Like I'm I'm feeling something right now. What happened for you in that moment where time froze? It was, I, I could say it was it was a mix, mix of emotions, right? Fear and everything was real. You know, you hear things like, oh, it's too cold in Canada. Oh, it's too cold. It, it, you imagine the cold. If you've never been in a very cold place. I mean, the coldest I could have was the freezers and the refrigerators, mm-hmm. right? Because it was always warm in Nigeria. And maybe in our dry season, it was a bit cold. But that was nothing compared to the freezing temperature that I, I experienced in London, mm-hmm. right? So it was so chill. I couldn't believe that I'm going to step out and <laughs> get into that weather. Yeah. So in that moment, it was reality, right? So this is it. It's happening. So it was a moment of truth and reckoning, right? Do I stay inside this warm, cozy Heathrow airport and make a choice and go back to Nigeria? Or do I step in and face my fears, right? And deal with the cold? That was that was a moment, like an aha moment for me, right? When I finally summoned up courage and I got out of that airport, I was like, there's no going back. You know, yeah. How did you know? Because I made a decision, right? It was a decision point. So whatever comes in this whole journey, deal with it. Everything else that I saw in the movies and everything else that I, I imagined that the UK would be was happening. Now I'm living in the movies. 
<laughs> you know. And Wazoo, this is so powerful because even to go back to the metaphor that you use, you know, how do you eat a, an elephant one bite at a time? I've heard that thrown around in, in corporate circles and so forth. And yet what you've just described is this real experience of, oh, okay, well, you know, I know what it's like to eat and I know what an elephant looks like. And you go and you take the first bite because you picture, you know, and I say the you as in all of us, right? You take the first bite and you picture, you know, if I eat enough bites, I'll get through it. That first bite, this tastes awful. And oh my gosh, this elephant is so much bigger than I thought. And how, how, how am I going to get through this? And yet you made a decision with that first bite, like just that I am going to get through this. I don't necessarily know how, but I will do it. So in your story, I'm hearing this kind of renewed emphasis on you weren't so caught up in the how it was going to all happen. You were just very clear that it this is going to happen and open to the fact that as long as I put my coat on, I'll figure out the next step. Yes, that that is that is well said, right? And and in figuring out that next step, was I sitting on a comma, or was I living in the comma? Mm. Right. So that brings me by full circle through what comma am I sitting on? Because I've lived experiences where I know there's an audacious, audacious task to be completed, and I did it, and I, I didn't know how I was going to do it, and it came out well. I don't know if I can identify commerce with those situations, mm -hmm. right? Now I have a, a feature talk leader program that I, I, I went for from my, one of my great friends, family. And in that program, we, we talked about things that you want to do. And I told, I told the, I, I made a declaration to the people on the program that I want to start a podcast. Mm -hmm. right? And I started making moves with that. I have a business partner, a great guy, Ayo, you know, very super intelligent guy, visionary person as well, techie guy as well. You know, so two of us came together to, to think about starting a podcast, right? And this is us now, I think about three years down the line, <laughs> the podcast hasn't gone live, mm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, but it's not like three years down the line, we were just sitting down, we're not doing anything. We've had about six episodes now recorded. But the podcast is still on life. And every year and every month, we have this conversation. This is going to be go live date, you know. And we think about things that we want to add, things we want to remove, how we want to tell our stories. Because it's a very great podcast that we think that it's just going to help our community in diaspora. We're talking about immigrants from everywhere coming to live in a new culture. How do they how do they survive? What what's what stories can they hear that can be insightful for them to know or learn things that they can apply in their situation, right? And yeah. we're starting with our own Nigerian community or African community. So it's a great thing that we want to do. And almost three years or so, if I'm correct, we have not done it. So let me let me reflect back here. So because this is this is interesting, right? Like here you you've eaten the elephant you've experienced the big leap you've gotten familiar if not comfortable with being uncomfortable and all of that experience that you described the doors opening at Heathrow airport and everything that has ensued since now has informed this new goal this new vision three years later of let's take all of that that i learned and that we've learned friends and colleagues and people that you knew and let's now share that with others and in a way that it can help them particularly people from the african diaspora particularly people who come from places that you come from and have lived the life that you've lived and so you have this clear vision of now my experience can be handed on to others exactly as you described when you were introducing yourself and you're sitting on a comma with it yes Yes, and it wasn't three years after, you know, it was more than three years after. But but for us, okay, we've been planning okay. to go live with this podcast for more, almost three years now, and we're doing stuff. <laughs> there you go. We're doing stuff. We're trying to do all we can to make it go live, right? But we haven't gone live, so maybe that is the comma. Maybe I'm in the comma right now, and I'm experiencing it. I'm working it out, you know. So having come from a background of someone has dealt with different situations and at the end of got the goal done, right? So am I really sitting on this comma or 
and by processing the comma, trying to get to the next phase. What do you mean by that? Unpack that a little bit further. Am I sitting on this comma or am I processing it, trying to get to the next phase? So, so sitting on the comma sounds like, for me, maybe that is our understanding. You're waiting for something to happen, right? Or you're, or you're wishing that something could happen, right? You're okay. Taking, you're moving and you stop and you, you're trying to figure out some next steps, right? Then processing the comma <laughs> is mm-hmm. you are in the comma. You're trying to find your way out of this big, massive um, hole that you, you are in, climbing out, right? You're not at the bottom of your hole yet. You're still not out of it. Mm. What is still a comma? What do you think? Because the metaphor is rich and it's open. And everyone who comes on this podcast and everyone that I talk to has their own way of seeing the comma. So that's what's so great about it is it's it's what you think and what you define. Yes. And and and, and it's it's a bit of, I mean, that's, that's for me, each time I say these things, I, I go back to my stories and my life experiences, you know. So it's a bit of um, finding that answer. How do I get off the comma? You know, I, I mean, I think there's a level of acceptance that I'm in a comma or we've got to the point where the comma is. Mm-hmm. And what is the distance from getting to the point where the comma is and getting out of the comma? Yeah. I don't know. Well, let's, well, let's unpack that in steps, right? One bite at a time. Um, as you know, there's five questions. So let's, let's transition into the second question. Let's operate under the assumption that the three years of work on this podcast is a little bit of a comma right now. And that's, you're, you're curious about that. What is it about the podcast that feels like a comma for you and then the second question is what is it creating for you it's powerful it's a very powerful question right you know because the value i think i'm going to tie it to the value that the podcast we are hoping that it will bring to our audience you know so and we it's going to be shared experiences everybody listening to the podcast is going to pick one of two things that applies to them you know but how does this experiences connect to your identity that you have become, you know, for, which is sometimes one of the things that I ask myself. And I'm American now, and I'm also a Nigerian, right? And I've also lived in different cultures that are not, I cannot really identify myself as being British or Scottish. Mm. But I know some of the cultures. But because I didn't get the citizenship, does that mean that I don't have that identity? Right. Right. And and in experiencing that in diaspora, for most people that have left their place of aboriginal or origin to a new place, you know, even an American living in the UK, mm-hmm. right? It's it's a lot of a diff, it's a different experience for the American living in the UK mm-hmm. because now you're in diaspora, you're an immigrant, right? How do you how does that identity help you to navigate your culture or the transitioning of your business or? the interaction that you have with your neighbors, you know, how does that have, help you to achieve some of your life goals and your dreams? So you share your experiences where you're in the UK and people are saying things like building walls in America and you're thinking about, oh, but I'm in a different culture and back home people are thinking about building walls. You know, how does that affect your conversation? How does that affect your 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 views of our life, mm-hmm. right? And you're a Nigerian and you're living in America and you're, you're you're probably having kids that are growing up born in America that have not become Americans. How does that how does that household navigate those cultures and experiences? You know what does that friction look like, and what does that um, heritage and culture, the mix? How does that look like? How what is the identity of these people? So I I like to say I'm everything and anything. You know, there's no limit to which we can be ourselves or not be ourselves. When we say things like you're made in, we're, we're made, we, when the, the, the religious people, the Christians say that we're made or that I believe in God, say they're, they're made in the image and likeness of God, right? I think it's it's a definition of infinity, right? For me, that's what I hear. That's what I hear. It's a lot of possibilities. You know, it expands to that level. So we're, we're hoping that this podcast can help people identify something bigger than what they're experiencing, and not be in a box and accept their situation of not having just one identity, right? But having and enjoying all the aspects of the identity that they have become at that particular time when they're listening to the podcast, right? Not coming from a place of lack, but a lot of abundance. There's so much there. And you really, as you were talking, 
you have me thinking on so many different levels as well and self-referencing here because I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge something and by all means, I'll put this into the space and then you you take it where you feel like it needs to be taken or not. It's up to you. But, you know, you were talking about an American who's living in London, for example. I think it's important we also acknowledge there's another variable because as an American who just spent the better part of a month traveling in the UK and in London, my experience was very different there than I would suspect a Nigerian who spends a month traveling in the UK and London is going to experience. So there is this other dynamic that we currently in our our modern society refer to as race, even though there's really, in my opinion, only one race, and that's the human race. But color of our skin has a role, and it plays a role in how we adapt. So I, I just want to acknowledge that. And what I'm hearing you say is that it's likely that that is one of these many variables, and yet what you're doing is so powerful because you're taking your own experience. You're being able to kind of repackage that and turn that around and provide it to others who grew up like you. And that can apply to any of us anywhere in the world, but basically to say, there is a bigger world out there. Here's my slices of the world that I've seen, which doesn't even come close to representing all of it. But in just those slices, Here's what I've learned about the world. Here's what I've learned about people. Here's what I've learned about societies. Here's what I've learned about culture. And that is enough for you to be able to sit with this podcast, this episode, this content, and challenge your own world. So it sounds like what you're wanting to do is invite people to broaden their worldview. It sounds like that's what you just told me. And that's that's again, Paul. I give it to you full credit, five star. <laughs> mm. Well said. <laughs> that is it. But you said right? it like you, you, you get the credit. You said it because you said that that bigger than what they experience. I, I, I write down notes as we're talking, right? Because I got to do the show notes. Bigger than what they experience, and you didn't say it exactly this way. So correct me, but something about you don't have to have one identity. You can have more than one identity. Yes. And, and I mean, it goes as far as the labeling and everything that we deal with as individuals in our everyday life, right? Mm-hmm. Being, having to fit in into a particular box just to express who you are. You know, I mean, to, to, after this podcast, I can become something else in the next minute. You know, are you going to attribute my whole life and bring it zero down to of the common podcast? Mm. That is a great question, right? And are you going to force me to go back and become that person that you knew 10 years ago? And what happens to the lived experiences that I have acquired that have informed who I have become at the moment? Just to be acceptable to this person or to this society, do I have to become something else? When you visualize your podcast and everything, and, and tell me, tell me so that it's spoken into this podcast, the name of your podcast. I know we're going to be putting that stuff in the show notes later, but I would love for you to just acknowledge and name and take credit for this podcast that you're creating. So what's it called? <laughs> it's called Life Unfold. Life Unfold. Yes. Already powerful, right? Because the acknowledgement of life, the unfolding as a process. And then I also see, I think in pictures, I see a noun in that because when you unfold, every time you unfold, it multiplies, it expands. Yes. Have you seen the, 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 in, in real life, the transformation of a butterfly? Yes. I've seen it in books. I've been studying biology, being a biochemist, you know, I've done all that. But when we, I went to Costa Rica during my doctorate degree, I have been organizational development. We have this international studies that we have to do. So we went to Costa Rica to study their OD, organizational development in different organizations. And we went to this massive coffee place and they have a beautiful butterfly garden. The first time I've seen a butterfly garden, I was blown away to see the transitioning of a butterfly, right? At every stage from the initial point to becoming a full butterfly, it's totally a different identity, right? There is, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that when the cocoon opens and something comes out flying, like, like it was a worm that was there before, something that looked like a worm, mm-hmm. a caterpillar, right? You know, so in that, in, in those experiences, because I sat in that garden and I sat there, and we're like, what are you doing? Let's go. And I'm like, no, I just want to, I just want to feel this moment. Yeah. 
we we are so powerful as as a being as a human being that sometimes we put limitations around ourselves and we restrict our transitioning or transformation and we pin ourselves down i mean because a pillar could have said all i know is to be a caterpillar and just remain there mm. right and all we'll see is a caterpillar. We will never know that a caterpillar will become a butterfly. I think you answered the question that was lingering for me, but please do add to it, which was what's so important about this concept of identity and more identities and the butterfly analogy and your podcast. So, so in, in tying that together, right? When you leave a nation, for example, when I leave Nigeria, I leave Nigeria as a Nigerian, and you come into another country, you you will not be, um, how would I, not that you will not be, you become a citizen through a process. And those processes that you become a citizen, in my opinion, is based on documentation, mm -hmm. official paperwork. That makes you a citizen of a, another country on paper. The expectation now is that you have taken a new identity. Mm -hmm. So does that identity, maybe, does that identity, maybe question, maybe does that identity discard your previous identity? So does identity, does identity uh, situations informs how we navigate in the society, in the community? Because you're dealing with situations where today you're an American, tomorrow you're an Nigerian, this might come out somewhere that maybe no matter look appropriate, in the sense of that community, or you think it's not appropriate, but the community doesn't even know that that's what you're dealing with. So it goes back to the to the um, understanding of the stages of the butterfly. Right. Right. It's still well, the same thing from this, from the egg that was laid and that became a, a caterpillar to becoming a full butterfly. Yeah. You, it's still one and the same, even though you're going through the transitioning. Right. You, and I don't think, and this is an opinion that I have, I don't think most people understand it to that level. So they they do it either or, not and, which is coming from my opinion, a place of lack. You have to lose this to gain this. That's powerful because that is what I'm hearing you say since the beginning of this conversation is that it's this concept of and, right? That speaking for yourself as someone who was born and grew up in Nigeria and then moved to the UK and lived and spent time in Scotland and then lived in America. And, and, and you're describing, you know, the immigration process, which is new identity, which kind of implies this replacement of, but everything you're describing and, and even the things that you may not have said directly or literally is that what you want to expose people to through your work and your podcast is that the the taking on these identities is in addition to it's the and it's that i don't become something else i become more and that when you became and again I, i'm just saying this for the illustrative purposes right whether you actually became a scottish citizen or not it is irrelevant but when you became scottish for that period of time in your life you didn't not become nigerian any longer when you became american as you are now you didn't not become scottish anymore or nigerian anymore so you you became more it adds to the the butterfly is always still the caterpillar they couldn't be a butterfly without. And so what I'm hearing you say, and you correct me where I'm wrong, is that what you want to do is to show people through your own life's experience that one, you can become more. And in this context, through travel and, 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 and global expo exposure and you can do it one step at a time, even if you don't even know where the hell you're going or how you're going to get there. Absolutely. Well said. Right. Well said. And and, and in this podcast, uh, we, we want to share stories and stories and stories and stories, because I think um, these stories mm -hmm. is what will inform us more. You know, my part of my worldview and my stories is just one aspect, Right. I mean, for example, when you share your stories and all your travels in Europe and, and South America is another as, as, aspect, right? But connecting the dots and knowing that you're not alone, 
that someone is going through this whole process and it's okay. Mm. That is what we are hoping that this, my partner, business partner and I, um, I uh, is hoping that we can get through this podcast. And the more I, I, I try to talk about this, the more I remember some of my experiences too. I didn't know, I know that I didn't know. <laughs> I'm trying to say this. I'm not politically correct. Let me just take this out of this whole equation, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, this will sound funny and this will sound, it might not sound funny. It might sound silly as well. Some people might say, what is he talking about? Say, right? You say, you say whatever you need to say. <laughs> I'm Nigerian and I'm in the UK and I didn't know I'm black. I didn't have that feeling that I'm a black man in the UK. Oh, okay. Ooh, unpack that more. What do you mean by that? You know, so the identity that I have coming from Nigeria is Nigerian, not black man, not a mm -hmm. black person. Mm. Yes, we know people can be called black in Nigeria. That is not, that's mm -hmm. the least thing that comes across. I mean, people. some people might say there's racism in Nigeria, but I want to strongly I, I object to that because we don't think in terms of race in Nigeria. We might think in terms of tribe, right, religion, but not race. Mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. anybody Culture. in Nigeria wakes up in Nigeria thinking that he's a black person. The concept of black or racism, in my opinion, till today, might still be a struggle for most Nigerians to understand that. And in our level of acceptance for, for different races in Nigeria, Nigeria is one of the melting points in Africa, in my opinion, because you go there, you see Arabs, you see so-called white people, you see everybody that's anything and everybody there. Mm -hmm. And we're not referring to them in, their, in terms of their color. Mm -hmm. Right. We might refer to you as an American because of your nationality, mm -hmm. but not because you're a white person. Right. Right. So living in London, I had no like. Race was the last thing on my mind. You know, it was about my skills, my skill sets, what I can bring to the society, how I can give to the society. Mm -hmm. And I'm in conversations where people tell me that I might have a challenge because I'm black. What does that even mean? That the three years of my life, nobody had had to remind me of that. And now this has been introduced to you. Now this has been introduced. And I have to see myself as a Black person, you know. So, And now I've taken that identity in a different place without being say hello, now we're going to make you a Black person. And I want to also say this, and I'm not speaking for Nigerians, you know. I want to also say this. Most Nigerians and most people from, from my own background don't leave the country thinking that they're going to be a Black person in another um, country. No. They leave the country maybe for economic reasons. Maybe they want to participate in developing something or some opportunity. Well, it's only most times when we leave the shores of our country, most Black people, that's when we start hearing the phrase Black race. So, so in dealing with that, there's a lot of what the stories can bring us together. I can, yeah. can, we can share in the Life on Food podcast. That's so much that people, I mean, it's so, it's so, Things that <laughs> you would consider mundane. So let's say, for example, in healthcare, I didn't know it was a challenge for most people that want to set up an IV line, you know, to take out blood from your some blood sample or whatever. I didn't know it was a challenge for most Caucasians that have not experienced black skin before to set a line until someone mentioned it to me and the person was living in the in the in in, in Europe and said that this is the experience that. She's happy. Mm. And I now remember that I almost had that experience. And some other people experienced that too. And my parents did experience that too. But wait, hang on, what's going on here? This is an opportunity for the healthcare system yeah. in these other countries yeah. to try and make the, uh, maybe, maybe their hospital staff diverse or even learn more about things like that. And not assume that this it's going to be easy. It's the same way for different, you know. It's, it's, there's so much nuances that these things bring that we want to share in the life of food. Yeah, it's it's powerful, right? Because you, you touched on so many things that are so important for all people to hear. So on the one hand, you have your target audience who you want to help make travel and life expansion possible for. And yet those very same messages are messages that the people in those destination countries could very much benefit from hearing. You said, you know, I don't leave Nigeria expecting to be labeled as a black man because that's not the culture you grow up in. That's not how life is. Why would you even think about those things? I didn't leave Nigeria expecting 
to be able to give blood in another country and not have somebody be able to know how to actually access a vein in darker skin, right? Uh, why would you? Because that's not something you have to deal with in, in your home country. And it can be argued in different ways, right? Well, then it could be argued that, okay, then in predominantly white countries, why would they know if that's not what they're used to, right? But there is a nuance and a distinction here, which is these are the countries that have colonized, that have created these multicultural environments that welcome people from all over the world and pride ourselves on melting pots and diversity and capitalism and so forth. So there's kind of not really an excuse for us systemically not to recognize all the different skin colors that we invite to come to our countries, right? One could probably go back and argue a similar story, right, about Lagos, right, being an international city. But the point you're making is that it's not just they use different money, the weather's going to be colder, you might eat less <laughs> flavorful food. Uh, fortunately, that's not my experience in London because of the international exposure, right? <laughs> but these other subtler, <laughs> more surprising and less comfortable and less pleasant things that it's important for people to be prepared for, right? Yes, you know. So yeah. So I mean, the 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 culture, the transition, and the value system. You know, um, the other day I saw <laughs> I saw um, a post on Instagram. You know, uh, and this person is in America and he's in Nigeria currently, and he was talking about the warnings that you get when you want to travel to international. You know, some of the red zones that you don't have to go as a visitor, you know, because you're an American, things can happen to you, something terrible can happen to you, you know, and this person is in this place, having a mad, massive uh, uh, time, fun, you know, exploring with the locals, having to go to the wonderful springs and all the beautiful landscape and eating the food. You know, and he's saying it on Instagram that before he left America, there's a warning, don't go to this part of Nigeria, you know. And mm. and I remember that experience, too, because I had it in the UK, right? So here mm -hmm. I am working internationally, and I had to do an international trip because I was managing um, our business in West Africa, even in London, right? So I managed the whole of West Africa, Ghana, Guinea, Nigeria, and the HR had to call me in and say, that this is the warnings for people traveling from the UK to Nigeria. Mm. And I sat there and I read these things. Poor, you won't believe how my face turned. Like, this is crazy. Mm. Who, who's telling you all this stuff? But and 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 I'm not to discredit the 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 security intelligence system, right? These things can happen, but the way it's being projected, the narrative makes it almost impossible for you to dare to step in into these places. Mm -hmm. Right, as a foreigner, mm -hmm. you know, and sure. and and I looked at this person that was the HR woman that was talking to me, and, and I said, "Do you realize that I've lived in this place for thirty three years before showing up in London?" She said, "Oh, that this is protocol, you know, then then read out all the reasons why we had to go through this process and everything." I said, "I'm going, yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going, you know." So it's yeah. not, um, yeah. and and and. and and funny enough, I travel with some senior colleagues that have never been to Africa before on that trip. Now they travel to Africa all by themselves, right? So there is so much narrative and things that we can share, you know, so they, they, they can bring us all together. And I like the idea that you said for you, it's only one race, a human race. So the division, the boundaries, the nationalities, the flags and all these things creates, in my mind, a situation of luck mm -hmm. i don't see it bringing us together as abundance so maybe in this podcast maybe people can get that inspiration maybe people can feel okay that they because there's a lot of st other stories that so imagine you're a doctor in nigeria and you show up in america you have a lot of experience just because you don't have your license right you have to go take up a job as a bartender working in bars and and maybe doing other media jobs, why you have these amazing skills that you can actually bring in into the society and save lives. With what that individual that is a doctor in Nigeria, that is a bartender in America, is going to psychologically, I don't think has been captured. Mm -hmm. I was watching TV the other day with my wife and we're seeing, I saw the same situation, some doctor from Venezuela in Mexico because of citizenship and license, and this person has to take over the media jobs, right? 
for them to survive and send money mm-hmm. back to Venezuela. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, I thought it was Nigerians that had to go through this most times. In America or in the UK now, it's just, I mean, it's Venezuela, Mexico. Someone has to go through that, right? What those people go through psychologically, the level of depression that they go through, knowing that they can do more, but because of documentation, you're not able to provide your services, especially mm-hmm. in healthcare. I don't think we're capturing that data or we're, we're looking at those situations. Absolutely. And there's there's a tremendous opportunity for you there because now what you're doing is you're saying, let's put the butterfly back in the cocoon. It's not physically possible. And Wazoo, this is such powerful exploration. And I, I want to transition a little bit because we could keep going. Like we could go and go and go. And I would love that. But let's 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 come back to you for a moment here. And the third question is what what did you learn about yourself? Or maybe the question I'd ask right now is what are you learning about yourself as a result of sitting on this comma? Yeah. So um I'm having more reasons why we have to get this podcast out. Because some of the questions you've asked me that have, have made me to dig deep into what this experience is, might look like for people listening to this podcast. And the challenge for me is I don't want to I don't want to be the one holding back people's progress mm-hmm. in in a sense, right? And I think the faster we can get this going, the more value we can add to the society, both for the people, the Nigerians and non-Nigerians and diaspora, anybody that can listen to the podcast can get that value. I mean, a colleague mm-hmm. can listen to that and say, oh, now I understand why this my Nigerian friend is behaving this way, right? And now I understand why this culture is like this, you know? Sorry, I have to digress a little bit again. When I interviewed for, I interviewed people and prepared them to get their visas to come internationally. And and I was sharing with my British colleagues that most times when you guys are interviewing them, they're not looking straight to you. You think they're lying, they're hiding something. No, culturally, out of respect, we don't look at people's eyes, you know. But in their own culture in the UK, when, when you're staying away from looking at people's eyes, it, means it sounds like you're hiding something for what they made me to understand, right? So you imagine this authentic person showing up for a VCA interview and because he's not looking straight into the other person's eyes and the yeah. person thinks that, oh, you might be hiding something and the visa is denied. Meanwhile, this other person, the Nigerian person is looking at this person and is trying to show a lot of respect mm-hmm. because that is what his culture has taught him or her culture has taught her or this person's culture has been, it is all they know all their life. Right, they didn't know this path of yeah. body language, and it, the the impact of that is so significant, right? I mean, like just the example that you gave right there, like that is a make or break type of scenario that one cultural misunderstanding can, and on both sides, yes, you, one one would think that if someone is working in a visa office and inter- interacting with people from countries all over the world. Not that I would expect anyone to be an expert on every culture, but to just know that there may be cultural dynamics or variables that I don't know about that could influence these interviews. So it's not just the Nigerian look them in the eye. It's the person who's interacting with people from all kinds of countries, understanding that not everybody looks in the eyes the same way. You know, I mean, it's like it always goes both ways. Yeah, it does. You know, it goes both ways. And 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 the training that maybe they have from back home before they get into these jobs, who knows what the training is like. And you have people that work in these jobs seasonally, right? They come in and they go maybe after three years or two years or one year, they don't have enough time to even interact with the locals to understand their culture because they're secluded, secluded in the consulate, in a restricted area where all Americans, all Europeans mix up together, right? They don't really mix up with the locals. They don't understand the culture of the locals because of maybe security reasons or the advice they were given before they leave America or the shores of the UK. You know, when you get there, mix up with these particular people, don't go here, don't do this, don't do that, right? Mm. So are they really investing in understanding these cultures or what is the interaction with, with the um, um, the foreign affairs com- community, right? So mm-hmm. there is there is so much, you know, that will feel the, I feel that we can bring out in these conversations, right? Mm-hmm. There is so much. Oh, clearly, clearly. I mean, you what you've identified already is enough to fill each episode with so many different 
things, you know, a checklist of everything that needs to be covered. But like you said, the each episode is stories and that it's going to be storytelling. And so um, just so much opportunity there for you. And Wazoo, let's go to the fourth question. What what has changed or what will change for you as a result of sitting on this comma? I'm already I'm already feeling it like we just got to get this out, you know, and you've had you know, I've, I've had to respond to great questions that's coming from you to trigger that emotion in me saying that, oh, boy, I think um, it's about time. So probably what I need to do is to reach out to my business partner again and see we review things and find out how fast can we get our timeline to get this out, you know, to start experiencing this and and get get that information out there as soon as we can. I'd love to ask a follow-on question, and it's a little bit of a bounce back to an earlier question. And I'm going to invite you to answer this from your gut and short, so as not to get caught up in story around it. But my question is, is, You've got the stories, you've got the vision, you've got the goal, you've got the three years of work, and now you've got the sense of urgency. What's getting in the way? <laughs> That's a great question. What's getting in the way? Hmm. I think I think I'm the one getting in the way mm-hmm. in the sense that I have to make it happen. You know, there's maybe there's something else that I need to do, but I need to reflect on that question. What's getting in the way? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because it sounds like you've got everything pretty, you're pretty clear on what this is, why you're doing it, and even some of the hows. There's definitely something there that's uh, just something that's just kind of keeping you from taking that next step or what have you. So um, this isn't a coaching session. You and I can have some more conversations <laughs> off the microphone if you want. I'm certainly <laughs> available to to help you unpack that if you want. But um, yeah, I love how you were just very honest and clear. It's like, you know, I'm not sure. And this is going to take some reflection, but definitely it seems that that is a question that maybe you haven't allowed yourself to spend some time with yet. Absolutely. And and I thank you for bringing me to this point, this moment, uh, to to think about that deeply. I'm going to reflect on it, and this is a great question. Nice. Well, then let's segue into this last question then, and answer this however comes up for you, um, because you have acknowledged that you want to reflect a little bit more on what's getting in the way, but shift gears, allow for possibility, because possibility is so important for you. What does getting off the comma look like for you? Oh, getting on the corner now, I think it's going to be going live with this whole podcast and, um, you know, start getting the um, feedback and making the impact that we want to make with the, with the podcast. That, that would be, it. you know, go live. I noticed you said not just the going live, but also the feedback. What, what What's important to you about this feedback element? Why did you say that? Yeah, and we want to hear from the community or anybody that's listening to the podcast what and how it has affected or what is the, what is their reaction to it. So that way we can we can also allow I don't like to use the word measure the impact. Mm-hmm. You know, because we might never really know what's what the measurement or the what that means for each individual. Mm-hmm. You know, for, for people that show up and ask us or share their, their reactions, maybe if there's something that we need to do we can continue to do or things that we, we might want to introduce more, you know, mm-hmm. depending on what the need is, right? Because we want to bring value to the community and to the society. Yeah. That that seems important. It, it came up and then you were very clear when you answered the question. So this element of feedback and reaction and and what people think about it seems important. I'm just going to take a leap here and ask a question. I'm I'm wondering for you, what might be the value of moving feedback up in the process? How could that feedback potentially help you move this forward with the sense of urgency that you yourself said you would like to have? Never thought about it that way. And then again, it's a great question. Maybe something that we have to share with my business partner and let's see what that means, you know. And maybe after this, the people listening to this, maybe something might yeah. come up. I don't know, you know. So, but we, we, I personally, I'm pretty much open to whatever mm-hmm. direction that this goes. 
you know, just something to think about. You, you have everything you need. You already know that now all the answers are within you. And, um, I am excited to hear where this goes and listen to your episodes and, uh, um, and, and see what unfolds. What I'd like to do now is ask you, you know, if, if you look back at the conversation we've had, what would you acknowledge yourself for over the past hour? I, I, I am very grateful, um, for, allowing myself to be in this situation in the sense that I could have declined this podcast invitation, right? And I didn't know where it was going to go. It was not a scripted podcast. You know, it's very organic. You know, so I'm very grateful that I accepted the invitation. And I also want to thank you again for inviting me to be in this moment and share this space, right? So, and I also want to acknowledge that I've learned a few things. In this situation, for example, what is holding us back? You know, it's a very great question that I need to ask myself mm -hmm. after leaving this uh, podcast to work on it and reflect on it, right? So, and there are so many insights that I had in sharing some of these stories that I've already forgotten, right? You know, so it's not like I came up mm -hmm. this morning thinking about some of the things that I've said, you know, so in sharing them and in re relieving, how would I say it, having to leave it again, right? It, in my memory, mm -hmm. my it's just awakening a whole lot, you know, a whole lot of perspective. Because after some of these experiences, I've had other experiences that probably had validated or consolidated the ideas that came out of the other previous experience. So in hearing myself say these things and answering these questions, there's a lot going on inside me and it's a good feeling. Yeah, I want to acknowledge you too, because your intention was be present, no presumptions, discover more. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. And acknowledge the fact that well, we covered a lot of ground. Like it's not just the comma you were sitting on or the intention and the goal that you have with the podcast. Like just how rich your experience of life is you know, as a result of the places you've traveled, the things you've seen, and just your experience in and of itself. I mean, we we covered so many different things, and we didn't even give half of those topics the 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 time that they could have had. But boy, I mean, there's just I say that to reinforce the fact that it is all within you, and there is so much in you that is waiting to come out in in this work and in these stories and in the people that you choose to share their stories so uh, I, I just want to acknowledge you for that like there's so much there appreciate that thank you <laughs> absolutely and wazoo tell us um and i'll put the details in the show notes but where could people find you if they want to learn more about you or um particularly this podcast which i know is still in development so no pressure there but um where would people find you if they wanted to reach out to you yeah so for the podcast our intention is to have it on apple as soon as we go live we'll share the information and we, probably with you again so that we can we can get people to go and listen to the great podcast that we're putting together and our company dream my life consulting our website is still in the works as well so when that goes live as well people can find us on dreammylifeconsulting.com and um linkedin i'm on linkedin as nwazo igdue so uh please go to linkedin follow me drop me a comment messages and yeah Absolutely. And I am going to, with your permission, I'm going to go ahead and put the URL for the site in the show notes because there will be a point when it is live and then it'll be an active um, hyperlink for folks to click on. Thank so. you. <laughs> And hey, Wazoo, one other thing I do um, with all of my guests, because I believe that it's an important part of their story, and I believe it magnifies and amplifies this work, um, as you and I talked about earlier in our discussion, but um, I invite guests to acknowledge um, creators, causes, organizations, um, individuals that are important to them. So who might you like to acknowledge or to boost or give credit to? Um, and we'll put that information in the show notes as well. It takes a village. That's what we say in Africa. <laughs> yes. Are you ready for the laundry yes. list? <laughs> it takes a village. <laughs> Let's go with your top three. Let's go with your top three. <laughs> and then, and then, because we don't want to give it all away here. Like, you, then you can you can acknowledge all those folks in your podcast as well. But let's it. Let's see your top absolutely, three. Absolutely, absolutely. First one will go to my wife. Um, she's been very, very supportive in this whole process and journey. Um, there's so much that 
I could say on this podcast that um, she has contributed to. And I would say to Lee Associates, LLC, Dr. Chris Lee, you know, she's very instrumental in part of the journey as well. And um, Dr. Josh MNEK, um, who has helped me a lot in my in my journey as a doctorate degree holder in organizational psychology. The Alliance International Institution that I went to, you know, California School of Professional Psychology, um, Alliance International University, where I got my doctorate from, excellent training. You know, I didn't know how much impact listening had in things that we do. And the training that I have in that institution for my executive coach training and all the other things, I think one of the things I took up from that was listening, active listening, you know. So, yeah, it's helped a lot. You know, even when I go out there to do trainings from places like Kenya, Nigeria, you know, the the amount of skills that I bring to the table it's all credit to Alliance International University for the OD psychology program. Nice, nice, nice. And I know some of these folks and um, certainly Dr. Lee has been uh, a guest on the podcast. And And I just have to, I have to also, in addition to thanking you for your time today and all that you've shared, I just want to say how much I personally appreciate it too, because there's some lanes that we have that are in parallel. I too have had, you know, over this past year or so, a lot more experience with international travel and, and exposing myself to other cultures and, and listening. And I just spoke about it on uh, this week's episode um, in particular. So I love these things that we have in common and I love the things that I'm also learning from you. So thank you for everything you've shared with us today. I look forward to our next conversations off the mic and um, and to promoting your podcast <clears throat> very, very soon. Thank you. Yeah. And I <laughs> look forward to that. To my partner, to my business partner, Ayodelo Guntubi, Life on Food podcast. We have to make it yes. happen. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I will look forward to seeing this unfold as well, to use your analogy. And Wazoo, have a wonderful afternoon. And um, thank you again for being on the episode. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. What an honor it is to witness these stories from these amazing human beings, and today's guest was no exception. I invite you to think about what you learned from this conversation. What stood out for you? What challenged you? What inspired you? And I encourage you to write it down in some form of journaling and reflection. I can't tell you how magical it can be to set aside your expectations and just let your thoughts flow out of your head and onto paper. You don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to do anything with it, but you can be amazed at what comes out of your thoughts and onto paper and what that can do for you. I know freestyle journaling has been a powerful practice in my life for a very long time. You just never know what you might discover about yourself. Thank you for listening to this episode of Off The Comma. Follow me on social media at Off The Comma and also look for upcoming workshops and events at offthecomma.com or better yet, go to offthecomma.com and sign up for my mailing list and let me bring the news directly to you. I am passionate about keeping this podcast ad free so that we create a safe container for people to be able to tell their stories uninterrupted by commercials and promotions. I currently cover all the production costs and I'm happy to continue doing so. And I'm also open to and appreciative of any donations that anyone would like to contribute. This is nothing more than to be able to support the podcast and cover some of the monthly editing and producing and equipment costs that are associated with this podcast. So look for the donations link in the podcast descriptions wherever you find this podcast. Be sure to like this episode, follow the podcast, and more importantly, spread the good word. If you were moved by today's conversation, pass it along to someone you care about. As always, keep noticing.